You're listening to the Faith Breathe Hope podcast, episode number 198. Today I speak with homeschool mom, seminary graduate, pharmacist, professor, and YouTuber Jill Bennett on biblical reasons to homeschool. Welcome to the Faith Breathed Hope Podcast, where we gain inspiration and motivation from others who share their touching stories of renewing hope and discovering purpose in any circumstance. I'm your host, Christina Reisinger, and today we will be encouraged by another tremendously inspirational topic that will embolden you to release fear, begin taking small steps forward, and move into your God-given purpose to live and serve in this life. Join me for today's story. Hello, lovely ladies and gentlemen. Over the next couple of weeks, we are going to have something different and very special for you. I will be speaking with authors, bloggers, YouTubers, entrepreneurs, and all around go-getters who all have one thing in common, homeschool. So whether you are a homeschool professional, just getting your feet wet in the homeschool world, or considering venturing into a whole new endeavor, these are the talks for you. Join my friends and I as we share the highs and some low moments, encouragement, perseverance, challenges, blessings, reasonings, priorities, how-tos, and yes, even some curriculum suggestions during this homeschool series. Let's listen. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Faith Breathed Hope. I am your host, Christina Reisinger, and today I am here with Jill Bennett. How are you, Jill? I'm doing good. How are you? I'm great. Uh, So... The first thing I would like to ask you, so today we're here to talk about homeschool. We have a homeschool series that we're doing all week and then next week or actually last week. And um, I want to ask you if you have anything that you believe about homeschool that maybe not everybody would believe that uh, or something that people might find interesting to know. Hmm. There's been some things that surprised me. Um, One, I think parents think that they're not equipped to homeschool Mm. or that they don't have the right education because they don't have a teaching degree. Um, But what I have found is that it's a lot easier than I expected as far as the teaching goes, because there's so many resources out there to help you. There's full curriculums. If you're not comfortable teaching, there's there's DVDs that have teachers, there's live streaming, there's, there's even live classrooms that are that are fully capable of handling that. But I've really enjoyed the actual teaching process that I didn't expect to enjoy. I love seeing his his eyes light up when he figures something out or yeah. learning with it. That's just something I don't think a lot of parent, parents think they can do. Um, I mean, I do have some advanced degrees, but they're not in areas that I'm normally teaching. Those are only in specific areas. And it's even the areas that I'm not great at that I find I really enjoy teaching and because I get to learn it too. So I think right. a lot more people could do it than think that they can. That Absolutely. As an adult, we're, uh, we're going back to our own education we get to learn along with our children. And that makes it a lot of fun. Sometimes I wonder if I enjoy the learning process much more than my kids do. Oh, I know I do. It's I so definitely excited. know I enjoy it. <laughs> More than he does sometimes. Today, we're going to be talking about biblical reasons for homeschooling. And uh, I know that we talk about this because we all have attended uh, Christian co-ops. And one of the most important things is to bring our children up in the way that they should go. That's scripture based so that we focus on having our kids seek the face of the Lord first. Um, and we've talked about that in the show about how that is the priority instead of always the academics, which you can get caught up in. But today, Jill is going to discuss some of these reasons that are biblical for keeping your kids at home. So I would love for you to start uh, sharing. Do you have a, a top five or how do, how would you categorize that, Jill? Yeah, I mean, there's a ton of reasons to homeschool. And I think with the the pandemic, a lot of people thought about it in ways they wouldn't have before. And I originally pulled him out for academic reasons. It wasn't for biblical reasons. It wasn't until I got home with him that I realized how wonderful it is from a biblical perspective to be able to keep God the center of everything we talk about, to be able to really 
involve that in our day. And there are a lot of reasons to homeschool that are biblically based. Like you said, we are to teach our child, our children, who God is and why he's in the world, why he was born, why he was put here, how to follow God's path, how to get to know God on an intellectual basis, as well as a spiritual and emotional basis, how to grow in, in his spiritual formation. And they're just flat out not going to get that in a public school. They're not allowed to teach that in a public school. So they're going to get knowledge there, but they're not going to they're not going to be able to wrap it in the beautiful bow that is the way God wants us to present it to our kids. It's it's a gift. It's not math for the sake of mathing. It's math because God has designed this world to be logical and for us to be able to work within this world and to be able to use these tools to do what he wants us to do. And so to be able to wrap everything in that perspective is priceless. Um, it's, and there's this big push that, you know, you want your kids to be these evangelists and to go out and to spread God's word in these places that are dark. And I think, I think we're fooling ourselves when it comes to that, because you're not equipping this warrior. You're essentially sending them out young with no experience, with no foundation, um, with no tools, and then expect them not to lose the battle immediately. And I remember I had strong faith growing up and I lost the battle quickly. Mm -hmm. I mean, I remember elementary school being taught that religion is essentially for those who just don't know better. And it drove a wedge between my mom and I and my my faith and I, and it happened young. And so I know it's vital that we we keep Bible first at home. We keep God first. We keep him in the perspective of the provider of all of this beautiful education. Um, I mean, there's Bible verses that go through, you know, that you are to impress these commandments on your children, to talk about them when you rise up, when you sit down, when you walk along the road, when you lie down. And when they are at school 40 hours a week, mm -hmm. how do you do that? Especially when, you know, they've got sports after school, they've got homework, you've got, you know, dinner and chores, and there's just no time left. There's just not. And he was so young when he was in public school and there was just no time. And even if I had spent an hour, how does that compare to the eight hours a day that he's being mm -hmm. taught otherwise? And it's not just that they're not teaching religion in the schools and teaching everything else. They're teaching a doctrine. It's just not the doctrine that lines up with our worldview. Mm -hmm. So it's a battle. It's who's going to win. What worldview is going to win? Is it is it going to be this push towards progressive ideals, or is it going to be more traditional conservative ideals? There's there's no um, neutral territory there. So, I mean, just to follow basic Deuteronomy six six, how do you do that? How do you raise up the child the way they should go if they are if you're not teaching them, <laughs> if you're not raising them up in any other moments except first thing in the morning, last thing at night, and then a little while on the weekends, it's just not feasible logically. Um, uh, your children will be taught by the Lord and great will be their peace. I mean, anxiety has skyrocketed in kids. Isaiah 54, 13, you're going to have a peace that comes with knowing the Lord and growing in the Lord. And I remember lacking that peace. I do. And I had strong faith, but still it's, they're being sent to a battleground without the tools. Right. And, you know, we know we've established that God gives us our children as a gift. And so we are supposed to, we have been given the authority over them, the responsibility to them to be able to bring them up uh, through what the Lord says to make them uh, know God and share God with the rest of their friends or whoever they come across to bring people to the kingdom as well. I mean, that is what we're supposed to do as Christians mm -hmm. is try to bring others to the kingdom. And if they don't know that, if they don't have that relationship with him because they haven't focused on it, then that's a very difficult thing to do. How confusing can it be though, if they're listening to, you know, all the different things. So we know that the world can be really noisy and we know that, um, we're, 
fighting. Even when we homeschool, we're still fighting for our kids' attention because there's, you know, internet and then they have these little groups where they have friends and you don't, you know, it, that's been from, every, you know, all the time where everybody is an influence here or there. And so you can't have complete control over what's going on, but how do you assure your kids that what they are learning is true and what mm-hmm. they are learning is um, meant for good when they may be hearing something a little different off to the Ooh, side? That's a good question, Christina. Good one. Well, I think that starts with, you know, defining your terms. <laughs> what is truth? You have to define truth. Where does truth come from? Where does objective truth come from? And they know deep down in their heart that there is an objective truth. I mean, you just basically have to go through teaching what is truth, how to identify truth, how to recognize truth. Um, You you don't teach them how to identify truth by showing them non-truth. You show them truth. And it deep down, it rings true. They understand it as truth because it matches what's written on their heart. So when you teach them scriptural ideals and what is God's truth, the basic rules of love thy neighbor as yourself, love God. I mean, it's it becomes really easy to identify what is false. And what's funny with that is that the world tries to tell them that there is no objective truth and they know otherwise. And I think that just comes with teaching them apologetics, just teaching them basic, basically how to identify these arguments and how to reason your way through them logically, how to come back to you know, just like we're we're learning in co-op, you know, I identify your terms, compare them, see, see where the truth shakes out after all of the logical exercises. And I think philosophically and logically, they're going to be able to identify it themselves when you've given them the tools to do that. Mm-hmm. And and yeah, it is there are going to be questions. The tough questions is, you know, how do I know the Bible's true? Well, I've got resources and I can go through point by point. I can go through videos and show them. I can go through the historical documents. I can show how things match up. And I think as parents, we need to be prepared for those questions. We don't have to be able to, you know, to answer those questions in uber detail, but at least point them to the right resources. And those resources are out there. The answers to those questions are out there. And just as parents, we need to be able to know where those resources are and be able to guide our children to those and walk with them through those tough questions. It's it's doable. It's doable. We just have to be prepared. And there's some really good stuff out there. Answers in Genesis.com um, is amazing. There's um, talking to your children about God and about Jesus. I've got some books over here that go through those tough questions with your children, how to go through those tough questions. Like, how do I know this stuff is true? Mm-hmm. It goes through how to talk to your child about that. The resources are there and they're very simple. It's just a matter of knowing where they are when the time comes. Mm-hmm. And, and that's one of the beauties of homeschooling is that we don't, or most most people I know at least, and you can correct me if you think this is not true, but most people that homeschool don't try to teach their kids what to think, but how to think. So you refer to them going out and finding those answers, being able to enter a conversation and have an eloquent answer, not one of necessarily argumentation as far as understand disagreement, but one where they can take what they've learned, take the facts, that truth, and be able to say, hey, I hear what you're saying, but this is what I believe. And this is the reason why I believe that. And so that I think is an amazing thing for us to teach our children so that they, and that is biblical as well, because Mm -hmm. the Lord gives us a choice. So we're basically laying out all the tools, as you say, and then we're giving our kids the choice to pick them up and to use them in the Mm -hmm. way that they use them. Oh, another tool that I love. I have several copies. I'm wondering if it's behind me. It usually is. Um, One thing that I really think we ought to teach our kids and ourselves for having those tough conversations out in the world is tactics. Have Mm -hmm. you read that? I have not. Tell us about it. Oh, it's amazing. It teaches you how to go through. I mean, they're learning all of these logical fallacies and things like that through logic classes, but this, it teaches you, it's meant for adults, but I, you know, I'm teaching it to my son too. It's how to have these conversations in short snippets and basically 
it takes you out of the hot seat. When someone makes an assertion like, oh, Christianity is just a bunch of myths. It -hmm. teaches you how to say, well, what makes you say that? Where did you, you know, how did, where'd you hear that? It's basically just going through and asking them to explain their thoughts very politely, very kindly, without having to assert information yourself, without having to know statistics memorized or know where the Bible verse is that matches that. Or it just, it takes you out of the hot seat and it helps them to be able to have these conversations just naturally throughout your day that helps people think a little bit more deeply about their own beliefs and whether or not they're just, most are just repeating a catchphrase they've heard, but it has them, it gets them to start thinking about, well, where did I hear that? Why do I think that's true? And right. it's it's just really, it's very simple. It's just this little method on how to go through this thought process with someone. And it gives them the confidence to go out there and have these conversations and be able to face others who may make claims that are directly contradictory or even maybe sometimes offensive. Mm-hmm. It gets you out of that defensive mode and gets you into just having a nice conversation and Mm -hmm. listening to what other people have to say and helping them think through their own process. It's really cool. I like that too, because it sounds like it diffuses any type of argument that you may have. Um, Mm -hmm. The rule is if anybody gets upset, you lose, you both lose. So the goal is just, you know, kindness, light conversation. Mm -hmm. It's really nice. I think you'd like it. I think I would too. I'll look into that. So, but I like that because you're teaching your kids not to come in defensively. You're coming in uh, with an open mind, not saying that, Hey, I am not going to keep my convictions. Mm -hmm. I understand what I believe and I am sound on that. However, I'm open to listening to what somebody else is thinking. Mm -hmm. And Hey, it's okay, by the way, that we don't agree Mm -hmm. on everything, uh, but we can still have a civil conversation and we can still learn to get along. So that is great. A lot of people in this world could use that book, it sounds like. (laughs) Um, What are some other things that, you know, are there any other scriptures? I know you named several scriptures. Mm -hmm. Are there any other scriptures that Mm -hmm. you could share with the audience about what God says about maybe the learning experience, how we should raise our kids? I don't know. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, because homeschooling really wasn't a thing during biblical times. You had Hebrew school. It was very small. It was very localized. You you went to school with people who had your own worldview. You didn't have this. You wouldn't send them to a Roman school. You just wouldn't. It's just not what you would do. You would send them to a Hebrew school up until about age 12 or 13, at which point they would either go into their local trade with their family and stay under their family's tutelage, or they would go on to start studying more deeply in rabbinical schools, or they would follow a rabbi. Um, They were in basically a private school environment with their own worldview. Mm -hmm. And even, but before that, even you, you were raised with your family. There was no concept of public school. And so you have to break down what is the public school for? Well, Ideally, it would be to raise the educational level of everybody, but that's not why it was created. It was created to create workers. It was created to remove the next generation from their cultural heritage and push them towards this progressive enlightenment ideal that was being pushed at the time. It was not for the betterment of the child. And so if we go back to scripture, scripture takes place during a time when this wasn't an issue, but there were outside influences. It just wasn't aimed at children because they didn't, he just didn't go out. The enemy didn't go after kids as as aggressively as he's doing now. So I think what we can find in scripture is even more important because it's sprinkled in to remind parents that that is their responsibility and I'm sure there were parents that neglected it at the time, we are given this responsibility to steward our children just like any other resource, but much more precious. And we see in ancient Israel, when one generation would fail to share their faith with the next generation, things would fall apart extremely quickly. And so I think studying the Old Testament overall is a great example of what can happen when parents fail to raise their children without a biblical worldview, without teaching them to love the Lord, not just the knowledge of God, but to show them how to grow that relationship. So let's look at a few scriptures here that 
again, we're going to have to extrapolate into our perspective. That's, you know, the observe, interpret, and then apply. But I think you get where we're going with this. Yeah. Um, Genesis 18, 19, for I have chosen him so that he will direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just, not just teaching them, but by doing it in front of them, showing them how it's done. So the Lord will bring about for Abraham what he promised him. Um, Deuteronomy, there's tons in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 4 through 6 pretty much is just chock full of information about this stuff. Um, only be careful and watch yourselves closely so you do not forget the things your eyes have seen or let them fade from your heart as long as you live. Teach them to your children and to their children after them. Remember the day you stood before the Lord, et cetera, et cetera. Assemble the people before me to hear my words so that we may so that they may learn to revere me as long as they live in the land and may teach them to their children. It's over and over reminding, teach your children. This generation is important, but as long as this generation dies off, we will all die off. What is left behind is our fault, 100% our fault. And if we fail to pass on this love of the Lord to our children, it is completely our fault. And that is far more detrimental than not evangelizing this generation. Not evangelizing the next generation is so much worse. It's got much longer term consequences. Um, Deuteronomy 6, 6 through 9, I think is the most famous one. The commandments I give you today are to be on your hearts and press them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. That's called a merism. A merism is when it it's like from A to Z, from beginning to end. It's two extremes, meaning to encompass everything in between. It's saying all day long, from the moment you wake up to the moment you go to sleep, it's your job to impress these things upon your children. All your children will be taught by the Lord and great will be their peace. That was the Isaiah 54, 13. I already said Psalm 1, 1 to 2, right in the beginning of Psalm. Blessed is the one who does not walk in the step with the wicked. Okay. Are we sending our children to go walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers, but those who delight in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. And his law is not just the laws. It's his word. It's his commandments. It's, it's the goodness and the beauty that it is he's given us. Um, and again, we can't control all of our children's friends. They're going to be in contact with people who are not going to hold their worldview, and that's fine, but we need to teach them that they're their most intimate friends, their closest group, the ones they go to for advice, mm -hmm. that they need to build up that, that structure of good, close Christian friends with the same worldview that's going to give them advice that's, that's godly. Um, don't conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Talk about homeschooling. That's what we want to do, renew their mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good and pleasing and perfect will. That's in Romans 12 too. That's the goal is to teach our children how to identify what God's will is in their life. Proverbs 1, 8 to 9, listen, my son, to your father's instruction and do not forsake your mother's teaching. They are a garland to grace your head and a chain to adorn your neck. Probably the most common one, this is even more than the one before, Proverbs 22, 6, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he's old, he will not depart from it. That one, the context goes a little deeper, but I think it still is, is pretty, pretty standard. Um, this one I think is beautiful. Philippians 4, 7 to 9, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Isn't that beautiful? Just to teach your kids about all these beautiful things God has given us and to keep their attention on the right things in life instead of being totally. distracted by all the, the garbage. The um, second faith. Timothy. Huh? The to seek his face. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. Above all else. Um, two more. Second Timothy 3, 16 to 17. All scriptures God breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. So the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. That's our job to thoroughly equip. And how are we going to do that? Starting with God's word. And then last, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future, Jeremiah 29, 11. That is 
Our job is to equip them so that God can give them the future that he wants, but it's our job to give them the tools to get there. So I I love all of those verses. And I think a lot of people are probably really familiar with a lot of them, Mm -hmm. but I'm sure there's several in there that they might want to reference. So we'll definitely have all those in the show notes. Um, I just want to ask you, so say there, we're definitely here to talk about homeschool. Um, not everybody is in the position to homeschool. So we certainly don't want to put it out there and say, Hey, the only way that you can train your child up and that they should go in a, from a biblical perspective is, you know, through homeschooling, because Mm -hmm. we certainly know there are parents that have to work. There are parents that, um, even send their kids to a private schools and, and we, um, you know, want you to understand that your kid is not gone just because no. you're sitting at home with them. <laughs> you're not the doomed. No. You know? no. So um, what are some things that parents can do who are, are not able to homeschool? Now, That's again, a good question. here to talk yeah. about the families that are, but I just don't want to, you know, disclude. You're everything. right. What yeah. And there are people. Well, first of all, parents? I think I would truly evaluate whether or not you can, because I came home for medical reasons. I stopped working for medical reasons and I never would have even considered not working. It just wouldn't have crossed my mind because that's just what the culture tells us to do. And yeah, we could afford a lot more if I went back to work. Um, Living on one income is not easy by any stretch of the imagination. It is not easy. There's going to be massive sacrifices. It's going to be uncomfortable at times. You're going to have to say no to a lot of opportunities. Um, But even then, there are people who just cannot. For example, a single mom with no other income, what are they going to do? They can't not send their child to school of some kind. Mm -hmm. It's, It's the same job. It's just a lot harder. It's going to be a lot harder and it's going to take a lot more out of you. You're going to have sacrifices in different ways. You're going to have to maybe get up earlier and have Bible study before you send them off to school. When they come home, make an intentional effort not to fill that time with activities, but to make sure you're having time to ground them in the faith because you can't just count on church to do it. They're not capable, equipped, or responsible for handling undoing all of what they're learning at school doctrinally. I'm not talking about educationally, but doctrinally, because they are being taught doctrine at school. It's going to be harder, but I believe it can be done. It's just going to take a lot more time, a lot more effort, a lot more planning. Um, You can do it, but I just, I think that you're going to have to come together, maybe find others that are in the same position, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, pull resources. There's tons out there that's free, but I mean, there's some that isn't, but there's still stuff out there that's free. I think the big part is just showing your child what a a walk with Christ can look like. That's more important than anything is if they see you studying scripture, they see you praying together. If you make prayer normal in your household, if you have a Bible study at night after dinner together and y'all just sit and, and read and think and study together and talk through issues, open lines of communication, talk through what they're learning in school, what their friends are talking about, what questions they have Mm -hmm. and just taking the time together to work through it. It's going to take considerable effort, um, but that's our job. That's our gift. I think it goes back to these small steps, these, these Mm -hmm. habits, whatever you can do, whatever you can fit in yourself up for that. One of the things my husband works all the time, it seems like, you know, he's also in school again. And so when we had this thing come up about how we are unable to get together and, and do all of the things. He started coming home on Wednesday evenings and, uh, doing a Bible study during dinner. So we down around the table and I believe it was Charles Stanley that I heard that like, he went through a, a lot of reasons about why sitting at the table, uh, yes. as a family and having that discussion is so important, even when your kids get older and it can be a lot more difficult as they get older, especially if they're in sports and after school activities, because, you know, we're, we're a dance family and dance can run until eight, nine o'clock some nights. So it. it's really difficult to come home. But if you have like one day and you mm-hmm. come 
home and you say, hey, this is the day that we can make it to the table to sit together and have that discussion. Those are the kind of things. What do you think about these small um, little habits, like maybe waking up in the morning and just opening your Bible, even if it's for five minutes? Um, That's everything. That's everything. Five minutes matters. Every minute matters. Every moment is a choice. And we wake up, we can get on our phone and we can check our email and we can check on the news, or we could go sit at our kitchen table and over breakfast with our kids, have a moment, open that communication line, go through that book I was talking about, you know, how to talk to your kids about God. It goes through quick conversations to have just to get them thinking, to get them talking to you, have their mind thinking of these things throughout the day. One night a week coming together as a family over dinner is beautiful. Every moment that you can find to model and to teach and to bring them to God and to pray, it's vital. It's it's everything. And it can be done. It really, it can be done. It's possible and it's beautiful. And even those that homeschool, I know sometimes we're like, oh, you know, we've got it, you know, we've got all the time in the world together to talk about God and scripture and all, but do we? Do we take the moments, those little five minute moments that matter so much more when your schedule is so packed, but when your schedule isn't packed, it's even more important because it's easy to let those things slide. But every moment is, is precious. And we only have so much time with these kids to build them up. Their worldview is established early. Mm -hmm. It's a lot harder after a certain point. So Mm -hmm. every moment matters. Every, just those little five minute things really make all the difference in the world. And I don't know about you, but you're inspiring me to be even more intentional. I'm I'm super excited. We're doing an Old Testament study with with my son that teaches him how to actually study the Bible. And I get, do we teach our kids how to do that? How to open God's Word and how to study it properly? Mm. How easy is that to forget to teach them? So I'm excited. I think we all need to come together like us moms and and talk about what we're doing, those little things that we found that help coming together once a week as a family and having a Bible study. That's beautiful that he does that. That's so sweet. What well, a good example. Yeah. Well, absolutely. And the, you know, modeling, like you were talking about, it does matter because your kids watch you, whether yeah. you think that they pay attention or not, they are paying attention. You think that they're over there in their own little world. And sometimes they are, but you know, they're, they're constantly looking to us to see how we react to things and um, waiting on us to really have that structure and, and teach them, even though they may complain a little bit. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, I, I'm a firm believer that they really do need that. Um, and I like the fact that the five minutes, you know, they matter because it can get away from us, whether they're, we're super busy and we've scheduled all the things and, um, or whether you said that you just, you have kind of a lackadaisical day and you don't really have anything scheduled. So you can put the ball down and say, oh, it doesn't matter, that kind of thing. But those moments do matter. Uh, I would like to also have you maybe touch on rest. So mm. there is, um, there are biblical, um, there's biblical information about rest and how we should, you know, take a moment and, and I'll, whether the kids are going to school and you're at work or you're at home and you get caught up in the grind of, Hey, how, how are you doing? Are you doing this? Have you finished this? That kind of thing. What time is it? Are we going to this place at this time? Or are, you know, have you done all of these academics? You know, what is your grade here? All those kind of things that we get wrapped up in the idea of rest, uh, especially if you're a type A personality, I say this because this is me. (laughs) A bit. It can a be bit. hard yeah. to wrap your head around. Like, impossible. I don't have time to rest because then I'm going to get behind, but it rest is biblical. Can you touch on that? For it a is. Margin, God created the world. He worked rest in from the beginning. And yes, the Sabbath is Old Testament, Old Covenant, but the concept of rest has been taught from day one. He's shown us by example to rest. We have to work margin into our lives, not just for ourselves, but for those under us. The Sabbath, you weren't allowed to have your your animals work. You weren't allowed to have your servants work. It was rest for everybody. And so if we don't rest, our kids don't rest. If we don't margin, our kids don't margin. You have to leave a little margin in your day. And my uh, one of my mentors a long time ago taught me how important margin is in your day because it's in that space that God works. 
when you're busy doing A, B, C, D, getting your checklist done, there's no space for God to work in that. Yeah, you may, you know, we pray when we get in the car, you know, that's just one of our triggers. We have a location trigger for to remembering to talk to God. Little things like that help. But God really works in the quiet spaces. That's when he can get a hold of your heart. God would appear to the patriarchs at night during the quiet times. If we are so exhausted, we're hitting the pillow and we're falling asleep, is there time to pray and reflect? Or are you not? Are you doing your Bible study first thing in the morning, but are you reading your Bible and getting out the door? You have to leave margin for God to work and for God to speak. So I've set up some practices to help me make sure I have margin because like you said, I'm type A. I schedule everything. I'm happiest when every little block is filled. It makes me happy. I feel productive. So what I have to do is I have to block in margin. I will write in margin or I will write in Bible study. And when you do your Bible study, 50% of your time needs to be personal reflection and quiet prayer. 50%. That doesn't mean spending 20 minutes reading the Bible and leaving. That's 20 minutes reading the Bible and 20 minutes quietly in prayer reflecting. Mm. It's hard. It's hard, but it requires being intentional. It's just making it a priority. Anything you make a priority, you're going to do. And you say, I don't have time for that. You have time for things that matter to you. You always will have time for things that matter to you. Um, you're just choosing other things that may seem more important, but nothing is more important than, like I said, modeling this, not just for your relationship with God, but modeling it for the next generation. I was so blessed to have grandparents that had such beautiful faith. I could watch them model margin. They would fill their day, but there would be margin. They would have, they would schedule in a luxurious dinner together at home. You know, they would schedule in time to sit and reflect. It was just so beautiful. And that's something I want to model too. I don't want my son to grow up thinking that every moment has to be full for him to be productive. And that is something that we are judged on in our society is productivity. That's something I learned when my health failed. I'm no longer a productive member of society. I no longer have value. I went from my whole identity being a pharmacist with a doctorate and all of this education to nothing. And I had to realize that that's not the way God sees us. He doesn't see us on our productivity value. Mm. He sees our heart. And that only grows in community and in those quiet spaces. So, Yeah, I absolutely love that because... There's so much struggle in that space to, there's so much comparison in the world, period. There's so much comparison, whether you're in a school room or your home and you're in a community or a co-op, there's probably even comparison in church. I don't know, you know. Oh, I'm sure. I know there is. (laughs) I do it. You know, we all do it. Yes. And, you know, and and you don't even have to discuss it. It it can just be something that comes to your mind and the Lord knows what's on your mind and on your heart. But it's such a heartbreaking thing to say, Hey, I'm looking at my child. I'm trying to teach them to stand tall and have integrity and be a hard worker and push through to persevere. Yet, yet, uh, I need them to sit still. I need them to have that margin. As you say, I need them, um, to sit with the Lord and know that if they are not 100 productive, uh, 100% productive that day or that moment, or they're not the winner in that moment, that doesn't mean that they're worthless. That doesn't mean that they're not enough. It just means that they stand up. They have an opportunity to make it better, to do it again, to learn all those things. And I've noticed some of that stuff with uh, some of our students in, in our dance area where they're coming to the space where they are upset because they couldn't do it perfectly. And we had a beautiful instance the other day where, you know, there was a child that was very upset. They um, were not doing the thing that they thought they should be doing. And it gave the opportunity for the other students to come up and say, Hey, you know what? You don't have to be perfect the first time. It's okay. We're all learning together. And it was just a beautiful thing because these kids were so young that they were able to do that. And then It was not even an hour or so later that another child had kind of the same situation 
And I looked at her, I said, listen, you were the one telling your friend that things yep. were not needing to be Aww. perfect. You need to think about what you said and how you encouraged her and accept your own encouragement. And so they're learning to work those things out together. And when we uh, are able to model for our student or our child, rather, um, we're able to show them how that they can use those skills and then go out and, and treat their friends that way. Um, but I love the, what, the way that you talk about scheduling the margin, uh, the margin, sorry, um, you, you talk about actually you write it down in your plan. I have to you write the word margin in your, plan I do, I have to break or whatever, you know, I've heard some people say they write the word break because I'm, I'm like that too. Mm-hmm. I will schedule hour to hour. And then sometimes we know that if we have to take calls or if we have to go somewhere, the hour kind of runs over by five or 10 minutes. And that gives you that space where you're like, you know, oh my gosh, I'm behind now. And then everything gets behind. And um, we talk about Mm -hmm. that when we're doing school that we're going to go ahead and do a little extra today so that tomorrow, if something happens, we don't feel like, you know, chicken little, the sky is falling. (laughs) (laughs) Yep. Yep. Um, Jill, do you have any uh, added encouragement for people who are maybe considering homeschool? They're not mm-hmm. quite there yet. Uh, they're you know, not necessarily taking kids out of public school for um, biblical reasons, but sure. know, maybe there's some uh, encouragement that you can give yeah, them. I mean, studying. even if you're not homeschooling, there's things you can do to to show your children the beauty that is God's word and the peace that surpasses all understanding that comes from a relationship with him. Um, I could talk you into homeschooling if I had time. You know, if I sat down with you, I could probably talk you into it, but it's a personal decision. It's something you've got to pray about as a family and decide where your priorities are, what your capabilities are, um, what this time in your life is like. But no matter what, I just, I encourage you to, to look at this as an opportunity and not an obligation. I don't want to add to your should list. I don't mm-hmm. want to add to your mental, oh, that's one more thing I need to be doing. Mm-hmm. Just, it gets overwhelming when you start to look at it that way. Um, and there's plenty in our day that goes on that list. Right. It's, this is more of a privilege and a gift. This is this is something absolutely beautiful because when you're giving it to your child, you're giving it to yourself and it it will enhance your life, like I said, in really weird ways. You will see God speaking through devotionals that you're teaching your child. You will grow spiritually yourself in those moments. Your family will grow together. It is no matter what you're doing, as long as you're doing it for the Lord, for His glory, as long as you're looking at it as an opportunity to grow as a family closer to God, I try to think of us growing closer together, closer to God. Mm-hmm. And it's as long as that's your goal and you're working towards that with, you know, accountability, with solid goals, with you're making intentional efforts and you're praying about it, God's going to equip you. He's going to equip you. If he calls you to do it, he's going to equip you. And today, more than ever, resources are available and free. There's more people doing this now than have ever done it before. There's materials. There's groups to come around you and love you and be there with you and encourage you in that way. Just take the time to look around and see what might help you right now. Pick something short term, like a book that you're going to work through your child once a week, y'all are going to have a family Bible study or a one-on-one Bible study. If that's all you can do right now, pick like a mid-range goal and then a long-term goal and start working towards those with you know measurable steps where you want to be as a family in five years and start making some goals, that, some um, steps that way. And even those little things you're going to see start to add up and that's going to encourage you on its own. It's You're going to see fruit when you start to put those those little steps into place, those five minutes Mm-hmm. here and there mm-hmm. pick places one thing i found is picking places that trigger conversations and prayer we get in the car every time we get in the car we pray doesn't matter if we've been in the car 20 times that day 
we do it. It's a locational trigger. We go sit down at the dinner table for breakfast or dinner. We pray and we have like a little mini Bible study. It doesn't take five minutes. We're working through books together on, you know, different topics for spiritual growth. It's It adds up. It really does add up. And remember, if your kid is not, if if they're getting their fill of one doctrine you don't agree with, you've got to, those little things add up, but you need to start to even those scales yeah. and you'll mm-hmm. start to see the fruit and it'll encourage you. God will encourage you as you start to move right. toward those positive steps. So isn't it so beautiful when you can start teaching something, you can uh, present the scripture to your kids uh, and whether it's through the biblical curriculum that you're using, or uh, you go to, to co-op and, and somebody says something yeah. or you're just reading the Bible. Um, and I guess I shouldn't say just reading the Bible because <laughs> I know what you mean, right? But you're reading the Bible and then later on, it can be that day, it could be weeks or months or whatever down the road, but what you're seeing is full circle. It comes around into a a full-blown conversation about, hey, you know what? Didn't we just talk about that the other day? Isn't that what God said, you know, in Job or isn't that what God said here or there throughout the, the scripture? And you're saying, yeah, you know, we learned that. Um, and this is how we can apply it to life. So that is really neat. Um, Um, two quick things that are really quick here and now that you can do if you've got younger kids or even not Superbook on CBN, there's an app. Superbook has taught my child more biblical theology, more Bible stories, more narratives than I ever thought possible. He'll go and he'll be like, oh yeah, I remember from Superbook and starts rattling off names and events. And I'm like, Right. Okay. That's impressive. So Superbook, highly recommend, highly recommend Superbook. Um, And then the other one is Down Gillied Lane. It's a radio show with voice actors. And it goes, it's this family that goes through life together, learning godly lessons. And there are different age groups all going through the same lesson. So no matter how old they are, they're going to relate to one of the children I mm-hmm. relate to it as a parent. There's a parent. And it's just so funny. We've listened to it all the way through several times. And every time we listen to it, God uses it in my life, not just in his life. It. So it's it's amazing. So those oh. two, I think, are really yeah. cool, quick, easy tools to start implementing in your house. We, uh, we've we used Superbook before. In fact, I believe it's on the tablets. And the kids mm-hmm. were like, and they said, look, we have a, a scripture for today. And I love it. I open it up and I can see whatever the scripture is. Isn't that cool, mom? I'm like, yeah, that is cool. Mm -hmm. Um, So down Gilly Lane, is that, is that a dot com or how do we find Um, it? I listen to it on Audible, but I'm sure it's available elsewhere. I'll, I'll give you the link. Uh, It is, there's different seasons. You, each season you buy like as a a book, you know, when you go for an audio book, they'll give you the whole season. And we just listen to it all the way through several times. And it goes through some serious topics towards the end. So as a parent, listen with it, um, with your child, if because there's some heavy topics in there, but early on, it's it's pretty, pretty right. smooth. But I mean, it's real life. It's stuff these your kids are going to be faced with mm-hmm. regardless. And it just gives them a biblical worldview in a way to handle it, a way to, to deal with. It's just beautiful. It's so well done. So if, you know, if anybody has anything else like that, please let us know. I would love to have more resources like that, that have been just beautiful gifts in our household. We listen to it at night when he's falling asleep, he'll get through an episode before he passes out. So it helps. Great. We have several things, but you know, we kind of go back and forth between Mm -hmm. different things here and there. So I couldn't even tell you what we were listening to now, but, uh, well, not lately. I think there, there's a couple, there was like a fish bites. I think it is. Have you heard of that? That's no. And, uh, I believe it was just like different biblical stories that they do. It's very short. So, you know, they can, they can Perfect. chew it up and, and yeah. turn it out, but there are a few others that we can probably put together. Cause I'm going to try to put out a resource list for people. Perfect. That's awesome. Um, Jill, I really appreciate you being on Faith, Faith, Hope. Uh, we've been discussing this for quite a while now. And uh, Jill is also a fellow, uh, I say podcaster, but you're more of a YouTuber, right? Yeah. Yeah. Mine's more visual now. I, yeah. I'm big on the visuals, the maps and the diagrams. Awesome. So cool. Um, so uh, we'll put the, the link to her show in here too. So you can head over there and check her out as well. So thank you so much for being on the show, Jill. Well, thanks for inviting me. It's always fun to talk to you.
um, for those of you out there, continue to be blessed and bless others. And we will see you next time. The 2024-2025 school year is just around the corner. I want to tell you about a brand new arts enrichment program in Jacksonville, Florida for homeschool students ages 5 to 14 called CFLEX Academy. The arts enrichment program at CFLEX Academy provides a creative and fun learning experience as students explore and hone their skills in performing in visual arts. The core value system is rooted in biblical principles and the belief that through passion, inspiration, hard work, integrity and perseverance, creative ideas become successful growth opportunities that enhance technique, a love for the arts, and leadership skills. At CFLEX, they strive to inspire your student to develop a great love for dance, theater, music, and visual art that will serve them in other aspects of life. Registration is still open. You can go to the show notes, click the link, and register today. And I want to thank you for joining us on Faith Breathed Hope, where you gain inspiration and motivation to renew hope and discover purpose in any circumstance. Please like and share this podcast and give us a review on iTunes. Be blessed.